Дорогие друзья, позвольте начать торжественную церемонию вручения премии Прицкера, Великой премии по архитектуре, здесь у нас в Эрмитажном театре. Мы в Эрмитаже очень рады тому, что это событие, замечательное событие в архитектурном мире происходит в этом году здесь, у нас в Эрмитаже. И это не только дань уважения нашему замечательному городу, но и для Эрмитажа это историческое событие, потому что относительно недавно мы начали по-настоящему понимать наш музей, как еще и великий архитектурный музей, который создавали и где запечатлены имена прекрасных архитекторов, которые, как мы сегодня уже говорили, могли бы получить как раз премию Прицкера. Кваренги, который построил это, зал, в котором мы сидим, Растрелли, Росси, Фон Кленца, Стасов и многие другие. Для нас еще очень важно то, что мы, Эрмитаж, сейчас начали большую архитектурную деятельность. Мы готовим большой архитектурный проект, в котором по петербургской традиции участвуют российские архитекторы, европейские, американские архитекторы, специалисты по э, архитектуре. Мы сегодня начали утро с обсуждения проектов, связанных с Эрмитажем, с нашими друзьями и коллегами, среди которых и один из лауреатов э, премии Прицкера Рэм Колхас. Мы начи начали в этом году и будем делать свою серию больших выставок, посвященных замечательным архитекторам современности и прошлого. Так что э, сегодняшняя церемония для нас очень э, важна, это этап нашей жизни. Мы очень благодарны Прицкеровскому комитету за это. Сейчас позвольте предоставить слово губернатору Санкт-Петербурга Валентине Ивановне Матвиенко. Уважаемые дамы и господа, для нас большая честь участвовать в церемонии вручения Прицкеровской премии самой престижной в мире архитектурной награды. И мы глубоко признательны председателю жюри лорду Ротшильду и учредителю премии господину Томасу Прицкеру за то, что это знаковое для современного мирового зодчества событие впервые происходит в России и в Санкт-Петербурге. Символично, что местом проведения церемонии избран наш город отметивший год назад свой 300-летний юбилей. Санкт-Петербург признан одной из архитектурных столиц мира. Основанный Петром Великим как окно в Европу, он стал самым европейским городом России. Архитектура Санкт-Петербурга вобрала в себя прогрессивные градостроительные идеи, высокие художественные традиции и новые стилевые направления общие европейской культуры. Своим неповторимым обликом город обязан уникальному феномену сплаву разных культур, архитектурных стилей и творческих исканий своих создателей. В Санкт-Петербурге и его окрестностях на берегах Невы и Финского залива творили мастера архитектуры из разных стран. Авторами первых генеральных планов Санкт-Петербурга были швейцарец Доминика Трезини и француз Жан-Батист Леблон. За ними последовала плеяда блистательных зодчих 18-го, начала 19 века. Итальянцы Франческо Бартоломео Растрели, как известно, создатель Зимнего дворца, Джакомо Кваренги, строитель Эрмитажного театра, в котором мы сейчас находимся, шотландец Чарльз Камерон, французы Тома де Томан, Агюст Монферран, величайший мастер архитектурного ансамбля, итальянец Карл Росси. Рядом с ними работали великие русские зодчие Иван Старов, Андрей Воронихин, Андриан Захаров, Василий Стасов. В эпоху барокко и классицизма сложился целостный архитектурный облик северной столицы, были созданы его монументальные ансамбли, полные торжественного величия. Но и последующее архитектурное летописи Санкт-Петербурга было 
много ярких страниц. С нашим городом связаны яркие творческие открытия художников и архитекторов русского авангарда Казимира Малевича, Владимира Татлина, Александра Никольского и их сподвижников. Здесь формировались новаторские направления XX века, супрематизм и конструктивизм. Классические традиции и поиски нового эти качества отличали творчество лучших зодчих нашего города последнего столетия. Санкт-Петербург – город непростой судьбы. В ней, как в зеркале, отразился путь страны, вместе с которой он стойко и мужественно пережил многие исторические катастрофы XX века. Три революции, две мировых войны, фашистскую блокаду. Но наш город всегда сохранял свой высокий дух и величественный облик. Не случайно в список всемирного наследия ЮНЕСКО внесены не отдельные городские памятники, а весь исторический центр Санкт-Петербурга вместе с ожерельем пригородных ансамблей. Мы гордимся этой сокровищницей культуры и понимаем нашу ответственность за ее сохранение перед последующими поколениями. Вместе с тем Санкт-Петербург – это современный мегаполис с населением почти 5 миллионов человек. В настоящее время мы разрабатываем новый генеральный план развития города на ближайшие 20 лет, девиз которого – Санкт-Петербург – открытый европейский город. Год назад мы провели международный конкурс впервые в истории России на новое здание Мариинского театра, в котором победил французский архитектор Доминик Перо. Санкт-Петербург нуждается в новых архитектурных символах нашего времени. Он вновь открывает двери для творчества мастеров современной мировой архитектуры. Мы ждем новые проекты и новые идеи, заинтересованные в притоке инвестиций не только финансовых, но и интеллектуальных, творческих инвестиций. Вручение Прицкеровской премии в Санкт-Петербурге – это новый и очень важный знак для дальнейшего сближения нашего города с мировым архитектурным процессом. Творения лауреатов премии остаются крупнейшими вехами в развитии новейшей архитектуры. Именно так создается монументальная летопись нашей эпохи. Сегодня Санкт-Петербург принимает эстафету от тех городов, где ранее проходили церемонии награждения – Версаля и Венеции, Нью-Йорка и Вашингтона, Иерусалима и Мадрида. Сегодня в ряду крупнейших мастеров современной архитектуры из разных стран мы чествуем нового лауреата, выдающегося архитектора из Великобритании, госпожу Заху Хадид. Она стала первой женщиной лауреатом Прицкеровской премии. Архитектура считается мужской профессией. И я восхищена тем мужеством и мастерством, с которыми Заха Хадид на протяжении всего творческого пути воплощает в жизнь свои яркие художественные принципы. Я присоединяюсь к многочисленным поздравлениям и желаю ей новых творческих открытий и свершений. Я передаю сердечные поздравления от правительства Санкт-Петербурга и всех петербуржцев. И позвольте мне выразить надежду, что наш город со временем также войдет в географию творчества уважаемого лауреата. Спасибо за внимание. Позвольте предоставить слово министру культуры и массовых коммуникаций Российской Федерации Александру Ильичу Соколову. Уважаемые дамы и господа, проведение именно здесь, в Санкт-Петербурге, 
торжественной церемонии вручения престижнейшей в области современной архитектуры Прицкеровской премии особенно почетно и отрадно для нас. Этот акт лишний раз напоминает мировому сообществу о России как о стране, многовековая история которой запечатлена в ценнейших памятниках зодчества. Подчеркну, что сохранение и реставрация объектов национального культурно-исторического наследия сегодня объявлены важнейшей стороной российской государственной политики. И во времена возведения Московского Кремля, и при строительстве Града Петрова на Неве Россия являла миру удивительное органичное взаимопроникновение собственных, исконно национальных традиций и традиций заимствованных сочетала самобытность с восприимчивостью к зарубежному опыту. И посему в историю мировой архитектуры навеки вписаны такие страницы, как Нарышкинская и Голицынская барокко, русские псевдоготтика, эклектика и модерн, советский конструктивизм. Сегодня изменение облика российских городов волнует нас именно в связи с потребностью органично сочетать подлинную старину с новыми современными строениями. По этому поводу в обществе идут горячие дискуссии, заинтересованно обсуждается качество реставрационных работ, стилистика возводимых жилых домов, отелей, офисных сооружений, пригородных коттеджей и так далее. Особое внимание уделяется повсеместно созидаемым в России после долгого перерыва церковным храмам. В нашей северной столице эта полемика особенно актуальна, ведь здесь предстоит эволюционно продолжить линию целостных, исторически сложившихся архитектурных ансамблей Петербурга, Петрограда, Ленинграда. Каким предстанет вскоре Санкт-Петербург 21 века? Этот вопрос сейчас никого не оставляет безучастным. Пример тому – широкая общественная дискуссия по поводу упомянутого Валентиной Ивановной конкурса проектов нового здания Мариинского театра. И мне также очень приятно сообщить, что на этой неделе Министерством культуры и массовых коммуникаций Российской Федерации подписан контракт с победителем конкурса французским архитектором Домиником Перо. Тем самым и сегодняшней России на деле подтверждается готовность воспользоваться самым передовым зарубежным опытом в области архитектуры. Отрадно, что своими смелыми проектами заявляют о себе и молодые талантливые российские изучие. Многие из этих проектов уже реализованы и стали отправной точкой в созидании архитектурной панорамы нынешней России. Хочется надеяться, что со временем и кто-то из моих сограждан удостоится той замечательной премии, для вручения которой мы сегодня собрались. Сейчас же я также с большим удовольствием поздравляю нового лауреата Прицкеровской премии, госпожу Заху Хадид, и выражаю искреннее восхищение ее новаторским творчеством. Хочу пожелать госпоже Хадид блестящего воплощения всех последующих ее замыслов. Благодарю за внимание. Добрый день. Министр, Габна. Uh, Mikhail Piotrowski, a very distinguished director of the State Hermitage Museum. On behalf of the jury and the Pritzker family, we thank you all for your tremendous help and encouragement. We are really privileged to be holding this year's ceremony in St. Petersburg, just a year after the Tercentenary, when the city is at its magical best. Here we are, a dream come true, in this amazing museum, a museum which in a very real sense is as great for its architecture as well as for its works of art. We feel there's a 
renaissance underway uh, in Russia, and it should give opportunities for architecture in the years ahead, as the uh, governor and the minister were saying. And I hope it's not too much to hope that today's ceremony, this uh, gathering of talent, could just be something of a catalyst, some fuse, some way of marking the dawn of a new era. Let's hope after the, after the competition of last week, there will be many more to come and that you have a new chapter of distinguished architecture. As we walked round this city, uh, we thought about prizes and um, I couldn't help but feel that your architects, you mentioned them, uh, Rossi, uh, Rastrelli, uh, Quarenghi, Cameron, von Penser, I could go on, would all have won the Pritzker Prize. And I was saying um, earlier today to some of the people on the jury that if only Cashin the Great was alive, she'd be our unanimous choice as first chairwoman of the Pritzker jury. <coughs> and on women, we feel the presence of great women all around us. Uh, Catherine the Great, the Lady Governor, and now we salute Zaha Hadid, the first woman, as it happens, to win the Pritzker Prize. And by a happy coincidence, this year's prize winner has been profoundly influenced in her work by both Russian constructivism and Russian suprematism, particularly Malevich, who lived in St. Petersburg. Born in Iraq, an uncompromising, dazzling modernist of extraordinary talent. You see the talent in everything she's done, from the great paintings when she was uh, just finished being a student, to um, strange commissions, a fire station, a ski jump. Uh, to the Cincinnati Museum. You see that talent all the time, and she truly deserves her place in this pantheon. Now, from this pantheon, we have four previous laureates here today. Norman Foster from Great Britain. I don't know where he's got to again. Where's Norman? Somewhere. We have Gottfried Bohm from Germany. Rem Kuhas from Holland, who is now working as architect for the Hermitage, and Glenn Merkert from Australia. They've all come from these four countries to salute you. So do we, the jury, and I'd now like to introduce the jury, and I'd be grateful, perhaps, uh, when I mention you, you would um, wave or stand up. Um, first, there's Ralph Feldbaum, the chairman of the board of uh, Vitra in Basel, Switzerland. <laughs> then, perhaps the most distinguished architectural critic, writer of many books in the world, Ada Louise Huxtable. <laughs> A man who has his own architectural studio and is a professor at Rice University in Houston, Texas, Carlos Jimenez. <laughs> Karen Stein is the editorial director for Fiden Press in New York. She's just done a magnificent book on modern architecture. <laughs> The professor of architecture at Harvard's University's Graduate School of Design, of course, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, is Jorge Sorbetti. <laughs> <clears throat> the only one missing, unfortunately, is our friend, uh, our star, Frank Gehry, the architect and Pritzker laureate from 1989. He couldn't make the long journey today. He's going to come here. Uh, that he promises. And now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce uh, Tom Pritzker, the president of the Hart Foundation, who together with his dear mother, who's next to him, have uh, continued the work of the Pritzker Foundation of the Pritzker Prize over many years. We're incredibly grateful to them. They sponsored this prize, and I'm going to ask Tom, please, to present the award to Zaha Hadid. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Governor, Mr. Minister, Professor Piotrowski, Zaha, ladies and gentlemen. Each year I have the pleasure of writing a speech for this great event. The effort affords me the opportunity to learn something both about the recipient and about the venue for the presentation. Zaha Hadid, of course, is one of the great architects of our time. Meeting her and learning about her artistry has been inspiring. I'll soon talk about Zaha. My challenge now is to try to speak about the enchanting venue that has been made available to us by the governor of St. Petersburg and Dr. Piotrowski, its director. For Americans in the audience, the temptation was great to open my remarks with the phrase, four score and seven years ago. That, of course, would evoke images of the Winter Palace in the year 1917. But for the Winter Palace, 1917 is really recent history. In fact, its journey began in 1703 when Peter the Great stood astride the muddy marshes of the Neva River Delta and dreamt a city into being. If ever there was a city whose vision was given shape and form by architects, it's St. Petersburg. From the very beginning, Peter the Great relied on Domenico Trezzini, a 33-year-old Italian-Swiss architect from Lugano. A parade of the greatest architects of the 18th and 19th century was to follow. This is the city that used architecture to open Russia to the West and open the West to Russia. We who come to this place from across continents and oceans of time acknowledge this history with respect and with awe. We listen carefully to the old voices that come down to us from decades and centuries past. My own family's journey was shaped by the history of this very building. It was in St. Petersburg, in the, this winter palace, that Alexander II freed the serfs and began to open Russia's cities to the Jewish population. In fact, this made it possible for my family to move from a small Ukrainian village to Kiev, and from there in 1882 to the United States. Tonight we celebrate an architect in a city that summoned architects to its very birth. This is a special celebration. Zaha Hadid is the first woman to be so honored with the Pritzker Architecture Prize. And tonight there's an elegant meeting between two great women. The soul of Russia and of the Russian people is carried in its poetry. And this great city, St. Petersburg, has its own poet, a woman who suffered in difficult times and who gave voice to all the beauty, the grandeur, and the courage that was St. Petersburg. From empire to revolution to siege. So tonight, St. Petersburg's poet laureate, Anna Akhmatova, and Zaha Hadid meet here in the halls of the Hermitage. Akhmatova saw the city as ethereal. She saw its buildings touching eternity and dancing with landscape, anticipating Zaha Hadid's production of the Ballet Metapolis. Listen to Akhmatova's words. How I love, how I love to look at your chained shores, at the balconies where for hundreds of years no one has set foot. And verily you are the capital for us who are mad and luminous. But when the special pure hour lingers over the Neva, and the May wind sweeps past all the columns lining waters, you are like a sinner turning his eyes before death to the sweetest dream of paradise. It is written that Zaha Hadid, that although most of her recent works are large buildings, she draws them as transparent volumes. Instead of the weighty presence of tectonic plates, she now suggests that the manipulation of geometry and structure 
could liberate a space from its confines. The preoccupations with the continuity of landscape becomes recast as open reaches and interior volumes. She is an architect whose buildings are shadows emerging out of landscapes. And thus it's fitting to celebrate her with the words of Ahmatava, who speaks to her beloved St. Petersburg. Our separation is, image, is imaginary. We are inseparable. My shadow is on your walls. My reflection is in your canals. The sound of my footsteps in the Hermitage halls. Zaha Hadid choreographs land, space, structure, and person so that each is inseparable from the other, and each calls to the other. My shadow is on your walls. My reflection is on your canals. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight it is the footsteps of Zaha Hadid that are heard in the Hermitage Halls. Zaha, thank you very much. Zaha, could you come up? You bet. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Governor, Minister, Mr. Petrovsky, dear Sandy Pritzker, Tom Pritzker, Pritzker family, dear members of the jury, friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I swore many years ago, 25 years ago, I will never say this word, but I have to say it. It's wow. It's the wow factor, and it's a fantastic day for me, and it's a great deal for me. I'm not going to be blasé about this. It's really a great honor. And to be honest, it's a delicious pleasure to receive this very special award. We all have to thank the Priscus for promoting innovative architecture in this very special way. When I met Jay and Cindy Pritzker with the Palumbas, who are also tremendous friends of mine who have supported me all these years, at uh, Mises Farnsworth House seven years ago, I had no idea that I myself would once be able to enjoy this generous sponsorship for architecture. I would like to take this moment as an opportunity I guess long overdue to thank my family, my friends, teachers, students, collaborators, and clients who supported me for so many years, who share my passion for architecture, and who continue to encourage me in my ambitions. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate the fact that many of you have come from such a long way to be with me tonight. I know I have not been able to um, fool around with you this weekend, but what can I say? There are some names I should mention in particular. Ram Kolhas and Iles Angelis have been crucial as my teachers. Their understanding and enthusiasm for architecture first ignited my ambitions and their encouragement taught me to trust even my strangest intuitions. The late Alan Boyarsky, the fantastic chairman of the Architectural Association in London during my student years and years as teacher offered me my first platform to expose my ideas. He cut a clearing into the professional world of architecture to erect a platform for experimentation. The late Peter Rice deserves acknowledgement as a brilliant engineer who gave me his weighty support and encouragement early on at a time when work was uh, stigmatized and seemed to be difficult to build. I would like to thank Rolf Feldbaum for his commitment and faith, faith as the client who granted me the time and artistic freedom to cast my vision of space into concrete for the first time. 
Naturally, my oeuvre is the work of many talents and many more hard-working hands. As the work expands, one of the prime tasks is to form a group of uninspired inspired collaborators. Michael Wolfson and Brian Massey in the beginning, Marcus Dechanchi, currently my team leaders, include many, among many others, Graham Moglin, Woody Yao, Jim Heverin, Christos Passa, Stefan Hoff, Sarah Klums, Gianluca Rekana, and Paula Katerine. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the tremendous contribution of Patrick Schumacher, a congenial collaborator for many years and years to come. He, br he brings substantial influence into the work. There are many more people who share in the efforts which have awarded me this great prize. Many of those are here today. Thank you all. Before I outline my current ambitions, I'd like to reflect upon some formative influences in, my, in the development of my career. I first think I might mention my secular modern upbringing in Iraq. I have to thank my parents for their enlightened open-mindedness and selfless support. As in many places in the developing world, all at the time, there was an unbroken belief in progress and a great sense of optimism about the potential of constructing a new world and a better world. Although the historical momentum of this period could not be sustained, I never lost this underlying sense of optimism. It seemed my brothers shared the spirit. I wonder which clues inspired them when, when I was 16 years old to sit when I, there was a kind of family gathering to discuss what I should go and what I should do in my life. And um, one suggested that I should study architecture in Russia, and the other thought I should become uh, Iraq's first woman astronaut. Little did they, they know that mission accomplished. And they have been tremendous support to me, and I, they don't interfere with my life. They just are there if I need them, and I thank them. The spirit of adventure to embrace the new and the incredible belief in the power of invention indeed attracted me to the Russian avant-garde, supremacism and constructivism. This was when I joined Raman Ilya Studio at A in London in the mid-70s. Studying the revolution Russian work, I realized how modern architecture built upon the breakthrough achieved by abstract art as the conquest of a previously unimaginable realm of creative freedom. Art used to be a representation rather than creation. Abstraction opened the possibility of unexpected invention. The engagement with Malevich and Elisitsky in my early work of the AA allowed me to relive this exhilarating historical moment. It was important to go back to this original fountain of energy that had inspired modern architecture. In fact, here was an unbelievable enthusiasm and an unexpected diversity of her approaches. I very much hope that these treasures of the early avant-garde marketing can survive the current surge of economic expansion we are witnessing in Russia today. One, one concrete result of my fascination with Malevich in particular was that I took up painting as a design tool. This medium became my first domain of spatial invention. I felt limited by the poverty of traditional system of drawing and architecture and was searching for means of representation. The obsessive use of asymmetric and perspective projection led to the idea that space itself might be warped and distorted to gain in dynamism and complexity without losing its coherence and continuity. Despite its, its abstract abstractness, this work always aimed at architectural reality and real life. One of the tasks I set myself for myself was the continuation of the unfinished project of modernity and modernism in the experimental spirit of the early avant-garde, radicalizing some of its compositional and techniques like fragmentation and layering. The meaning of fragmentation is to open the hermetic volumes to offer porosity instead of fortification. I have always been concerned with the animation of the ground condition. The ground has the highest urban potential and has been neglected by traditional architecture. The ground plane should open up and multiply. I use the concept of artificial landscape and topography as means to impregnate, impregnate the ground with activities without losing the fluidity of, and seamlessness of the urban geometry. Ultimately, architecture is all about creation of pleasant simulating settings for all aspects of social life. However, contemporary society is not standing still. 
spatial arrangements evolve with patterns of life. As Ms. Vanderoa said, architecture is the will of an epoch living, changing new. I think what is new in our epoch is a new level of social complexity. There are no simple formulae anymore, no global solutions and little repetition. I believe that the complexities of the and the dynamism of contemporary life cannot be cast into simple platonic forms provided by the classic, can classic canon, nor does the modern style afford enough means of articulation. We have to deal with social diagrams that are more complex and layered when compared with social diagrams of the early modern period. My work has, has been therefore concerned with the expansion of the compositional repertoire available to urbanists, designers to cope with the increase in complexity. This includes the attempt to organize and express dynamic processes with a sp spatial and tectonic construct. This ambition operates on many scales from the organization of a whole urban fields via various building scales down to interior spaces. The initial sense of abstraction, ab abstraction and abstra abstractness and strangeness in, is unavoidable and not a sign of personal willfulness. My primary concern has always been with organization rather than expression. At the same time, as the rest of society pushes architecture by posing a new set of ca a characteristic problem, the new digital tools pull architecture into an unchar uncharted territory of opportunity. This is one of my current preoccupations the development of an organic language of architecture based on these new tools, which allow us to integrate high, highly complex forms into a fluid and seamless whole. The exciting thing is that these ambitions have since moved from the canvas into various construction sites, and I hope this milestone of the Pritzker Prize will allow me to give a further push in that direction. Thank you very much.